everybody. Welcome to another week of Too Much Shenanigans. I am Shannon. And I am also Shannon. And uh, as you know, Too Much Shenanigans is just a show where the two of us, we talk about things that we have been reading, watching, or listening to lately. Uh, and we always start off the show by doing some sort of cheesy get-to-know-you question. You can always feel free to answer it in the chat as we answer it ourselves. So I got to yes. pick the question this month. Uh, and my question was, Shannon, what is the best gift you have ever received or your favorite gift that you've ever received? Uh, okay. So my favorite gift I've ever received, um, that's a hard one because I've gotten a lot of great gifts, but... I would say the one that I can remember the most and that I was the most excited about was for my sixth birthday. Uh, so I was turning six and my parents, uh, that day they had like barricaded themselves in my bedroom and wouldn't let me go in. Um, I could hear music playing and there was banging and noise. And finally that evening they were done and they took me upstairs and they had remodeled my bedroom uh, to be unicorn themed. And I had a bed with a canopy. I was very excited. They had bought me a canopy bed with, um, it was lavender with unicorns and rainbows on it with a matching comforter and everything. They painted the walls lavender. They put unicorn wallpaper along the top of the bedroom. They got a matching dresser with the bed. Like they had gone all out. And because I loved you, I love unicorns. I'm wearing a unicorn hoodie right now. I remember just being so excited that uh, I had this unicorn bedroom with this great canopy bed. And it was just so that was my, uh, that is one of my most favorite gifts. And um, it was just, and I think about it now, my parents just, they put so much work that in that day just to surprise me with that. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I, I loved, I loved my uh, unicorn bedroom. Oh my gosh. So that's, that's my answer. That's so magical. That's such a cool room. How could you ever want to leave that room? I feel like that's so wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, and what's funny is uh, the my old bedroom, the room, it's the walls are still lavender with the unicorn wallpaper, even though it's my mom's like office now because they just haven't wanted to repaint or anything. So I can still go back home and see the unicorn wallpaper. It's amazing. Nice. Okay, so the best gift that I've ever received, um, I actually kind of knew ahead of time what it was going to be because I'm one of those weird people who don't like surprises, or at least not when it comes to gifts. Like, I, I have way more excitement in trying to figure out what the gift is going to be than actually receiving the gift itself. Um, I'm that child who always would look and try and find the Christmas gifts ahead of time because it... It's like a game ah. of like a mystery. You have to figure out where they're hidden. And then it's like, oh, the satisfaction of the hunt. Um, and so <laughs> for... Um, Your parents must have loved that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Everyone in my family just loved me so much because of it. Uh, to this day, uh, <laughs> they, well, they all know I'm like this. I'm still like that. Um, <laughs> I do know where the Christmas gifts are hidden this year. Good thing my uh, my dad does not watch because he doesn't know that I know. Um, but anyway, um, so it was two years ago. My brother and I went to Five and Below and we found these cool llama stuffed animals there. And they were, you know, they're $5. And we had this joke about uh, these characters um, that were both llamas. And we're like, oh, perfect. It's our, it's our characters that we made up. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to buy this for you. Uh, but you're not allowed to get it until Christmas Day. And I said, okay, that's fine. And so he decided that on Christmas Day that not only was he going to wrap this gift, no, he also was going to make like a scavenger hunt in order for me to hunt down and find where this stuffed animal llama was at, which was amazing uh, because, you know, he came up with these cheesy, dumb riddles for each location throughout my house. And then at each location, he made like a newspaper version of my llama. It was like the same exact size, but made of newspaper. Oh, wow. And he printed out the face of, like, the llama, like, a picture of it, and pasted it on the front 
of these newspaper dummies. And so it was the most horrific looking thing of just these like, <laughs> this collection of newspaper llamas with like plastered faces on it like it's something from like silence of the lambs or something um and like i still have all of those newspaper llamas like in a corner in my bedroom because they just make me laugh so hard because you just open a cabinet door and there there's a creepy newspaper llama um yeah so that was my favorite i think one of my favorite gifts i've ever gotten because i just had so much fun uncovering it and yeah just i love the creepiness of it all so yeah that that must be fun to explain to people like they come in your room and like open the <laughs> door and there's like a creepy llama there and yeah they're like what in the world and it's not that there's That's one awesome, there's multiple ones because at each location there was mm -hmm. one so i just have a pile a pile of creepy llamas um but i nice. love it i love it yeah awesome. Okay, so Very let's just go ahead. We can transition um, yep. into our show for the evening. Um, we have a lot of good things lined up. And Shannon just informed me, uh, you know, right before the show that this first one that I'm going to be talking about uh, actually won the Goodreads Award for Poetry, right? Yes, yes, she did. She won uh, Best Poetry Collection uh, for the Goodreads. So the readers voted for her. So, yep, yeah, she just won it. And I mean, I would say that that is pretty accurate. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about Margaret Atwood's uh, latest collection of poetry called Dearly. Um, it only came out like a month ago, even. Like, it's pretty new, I feel like. Um, yeah. And, you know, I first heard about it. Uh, they had Margaret Atwood on NPR a couple weeks ago. Um, and she is actually reading a couple of the poems that were featured inside of this book. And I highly recommend if you get a chance to listen to Margaret Atwood read this poetry. Like, wow, what an experience. Um, she read uh, a poem about cicadas that's about midway through the book, um, which really caught my attention. If you have read <laughs> this collection of poetry, you'll know exactly which one I'm talking about. Um, I, I won't go into detail here on the air just because it's probably for adult audiences only. Uh, but uh, the final poem in the book is called Blackberries. And it's just a story about, you know, women going out and picking blackberries and how, um, you know, the blackberries become this metaphor of life. And, um, you know, you pick all these good moments throughout life and eventually, you know, they're going to go away. They're not always going to be there, but they're still so beautiful. And you're not always going to be here and you're going to go away. And I just know that like, when I heard her read this poem, like, she started breaking down, like, crying halfway through it on NPR, and I just, like, started sobbing in my car, um, because, wow, it was so impactful, and so I was like, okay, I have, I have to get this poetry book, I have to read it, mm -hmm. um, and so I got it yeah. here at the library, um, I was really glad that there weren't a ton of holds at the time when I uh, requested it, and, oh my gosh, um, just, everything from start to finish in this collection is wonderful uh, there's various themes throughout you have themes um talking about growing older and death and remembering um there's a lot of conversations about uh, like alzheimer's like dementia um there's themes about birds in there and environmentalism and how to save the planet and then you have poems about cicadas and slugs and then there's poetry about zombies and vampires and aliens and werewolves and you're just like margaret atwood what are you doing um but she's brilliant um and everything she does and yes she has a whole section that's talking about um like women who have gone missing and how people mourn for these women and how wrong it is and there's there's so much packed into such a short amount of work and so i know i found myself just sobbing like hysterically within the first three pages of the book because I'm just like oh my gosh because what you, maybe you don't know or maybe listeners don't know about Margaret Atwood is about I think like a year and a half to two years ago she actually lost um, her longtime life partner he passed away and it you know it was very sad and like kind of tragic um, it was one of those things where he he had an illness and they knew that he was probably going to get dementia along the way and he was gonna forget um, a lot of things and it was probably gonna end pretty ugly um, and that kind of is the course that it took um, unfortunately and so this you know book of poetry really became sort of like a catharsis I think in a lot of ways for her and there's you can see how she's working through these emotions of like 
grieving the passing of people who you care about, but then also trying to honor and remember them. Um, and then acknowledging yeah. the beautiful things that you had in your life together. And wow, like how wonderful that you got to spend so much time with someone you cared so much about. Um, and so, like, like I said, it, you just feel it from the very first page throughout. And you just go through these waves of like, you know, you're laughing with her. And it's, she's, I feel like a lady who's just willing to say what she needs. You know, she doesn't hold back. Yeah. Um, and you're just like, oh, yeah, I feel you, Margaret. Yeah, power to you. Um, <laughs> And then, and then you're just crying. You're probably crying with her because you're just, you're so emotionally invested um, in this poetry and relating it to your own life. And yeah, I honestly think there is probably something for everyone within this collection. Um, but now, Shannon, have you read anything else by Margaret Atwood? Um, I have read The Handmaid's Tale. And then I have read some of her earlier poetry um, because I did get to meet her. Oh, that's <laughs> she right. I came forgot. In... Oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back in, oh, it would have been 2012. She visited the university I was attending and she read some of her poetry. So we read some in class and, um, and uh, yeah, she, she's wonderful. She reminded me of just like a, a pixie lady who is just magical and she smiles a lot and um yeah so i do want to i i've been meaning that's this is on my to be a, to be read list for sure because i do i admire her greatly and her work and uh um and i know she's in her 80s mm -hmm. so like this it's not surprising that uh you know the work is focusing on the end of life uh rather than you know er some of her earlier work of course um and uh yeah so i i do really want to read it and i suggest everybody else read it and i I've, I've been meaning to read other margaret atwood works as well like oryx and crake uh and things it's just oh my tbr list is <laughs> really way too long so i mean I, but you're a proper yeah, librarian I, then if your to be read less is long <laughs> i know it's let's just say it's uh in the the triple digits at the moment so nice. um yeah i know it's like will i even have enough time in this lifetime to ever get to read all of this we'll see <laughs> so yeah but uh, for sure, I, I haven't read it, but I would recommend it. And like I said, a lot of other readers will recommend it, too, because she did read she did win the Goodreads Choice Awards. So, yes, get it on the hold Ooh. list now because everyone's yes. going to be trying to get a hold of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now that she won, like, seriously, everything that won a Goodreads Choice Award this last week, I get on the hold list for them now because they're going to be popular. Okay, so we'll now talk about uh, your first thing of the evening, Shannon. Yes. Uh, which is they threw us away, the Teddy saga. Yes. So something different, uh, for sure. So I've been trying to read some more middle grade um, because I primarily re read YA um, and adult, but you know I, I I've been trying to read some more middle grade, and I saw this review and I think it was school library journal mm -hmm. and the cover just intrigued me the, the it's it seems so dark and like you know like desperate and dis there's like despair but they're teddy bears mm. uh and then it's called they threw us away and you're like wow this is what is this and so I decided to check it out and read it and I would say it is definitely different from anything I've ever read before, and in a good way. Um, and so, basically, it's Buddy. He's that blue teddy bear there in the front. He is a Bookington teddy bear. And he wakes up, and he's confused because he's not in his box. He's always been in his box in a toy store, but now he's not in his box, and he realizes he's in a garbage dump. So he's like in the landfill and he doesn't know how he got there. He has no memory of it. Uh, and he figures out that he can get up and he can walk around and he finds a few other teddy bears. Um, they're actually still in their boxes. So he has to get them out. Um, he meets Sonny, uh, who is the, the yellow bear 
uh, in, on the cover. And then uh, Sugar is the pink bear dancing around kind of by the they threw us away. And then Reginald, who is actually on the back of the book, so you can't see him. <laughs> but he's a great teddy bear. And um, they all have different personalities. Um, they Buddy is like the leader. He found them, so he becomes the leader. And it's... So basically, they're trying to figure out how they got there. Why are they? Why were they thrown away? Um, and what's going on? And they need to find children, because a teddy bear's whole purpose in life is to, you know, have a child, and then the child, the first time they get a hug from a child, then they'll get forever sleep, which uh, is basically they death. Uh, so, but they really want forever sleep. They want to be hugged and then they'll, you know, they'll just sleep forever. And, uh, it's, and so they go on, you know, the adventure to get out of the landfill and try to find some children. And it's just, it's, it's a dark tale, but it's also snuggly because it's teddy bears and they are, you know, they do think like teddy bears and it's just and they're really cute there's wonderful black and white illustrations in the book um but they have the same style uh, as the cover um daniel cross he does the he writes and he does the illustrations um and it's like they create this mythos reginald is like the smart bear who knows everything and he knows these stories about how these bears came to be the teddy bears and it was the mother who created them and Proto was the first bear. And so this tales interspersed with Reginald telling these like myths, like creation story of where they came from. And I just have so many questions about like this whole, how this world works and these teddy bears that I'm going to have to read the sequel <laughs> because they're, it kind of like ends on a cliffhanger. And, um, it's it's interesting because it's these teddy bears facing um, or being surrounded by real world issues, and like as an adult reading a middle grade book, like I can see them, like you know these these issues that are being brought up and kind of introduced, but they are presented in such a way that I think, you know, the middle grade audience, the you know the eight to twelve year olds. Um, it's it's interesting enough that they wouldn't like it's not so blatant that it's like smacking them in the face i just noticed it because you know i i'm a librarian and i'm an adult so um and like so there's like uh, identity like who you are um especially teddy he has these because the story's mostly told from his point of view he's like you know having these questions like who am i what kind of bear am i why did this happen um, you know, how to be a friend because the the four of them are learning to, you know, work together and um, how friendship works because they're all different um, and like um, they're surrounded by poverty and there's violence. There's even body horror, uh, teddy bear body horror, which I know sounds like what, but um, so I mean, like, I would say the most sensitive kids probably shouldn't read this book, but I think those who like scarier books you know um it, they would really like this book and then also one thing i really liked is so sugar that dancing pink teddy bear her box was dented in on the top so her head is half dented in so she's like a damaged teddy bear and it affects the way she thinks and the way she acts and talks um and so they address how to treat someone who is different, who is damaged. And I really liked that, um, the way they approached that, you know, like approaching someone who uh, might think differently and act differently from the way you think should be normal. So, yeah, that is They Threw Us Away, the Teddy Saga. Um, it actually made me miss my teddy bear from when I was a kid. Whitey, I I'm not. Sh I think he's in storage somewhere. So um, yeah, but I I do. I think it it was actually well done uh, and uh, very intriguing, very intriguing. So that's they threw us away by Daniel Cross. It definitely was giving me like 
Toy Story vibes of just like yes yeah yeah like Toy Story three mm-hmm. yes uh, yes yes for sure like that's yeah I was thinking about Toy Story at the same like time as I was reading it so for sure it's very it's got some Toy Story three vibes. Mm. Oh yeah, because they def- they know when adults are around, they have to play dead. So it's like classic textbook you know, Toy Story. Yes, exactly. They're alive, but then when you're looking at them, they lo- you know they have to go limp. So <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so it's it's it was a very interesting um, mythos around the creation of teddy bears and why they are like aware. So I, I'm interested to learn more. <laughs> So I'll have to wait for the sequel, I guess. <laughs> yep. So, all okay. right. Moving yeah. on to your next one, which I believe is a manga. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about the manga and ultimately the anime, uh, The Promised Neverland. Um, so for folks who don't know about The Promised Neverland, uh, I'll try to give you a summary. Uh, just I me. <laughs> yeah. I, I won't lie. The summary is going to be very brief. Um, because there's a lot about the show I can't talk about, um, because of spoilers and it's a wild ride and I don't want to deprive anybody of the joy of what they will go on if they watch it. Um, so the scene opens up, um, you find yourself, there is an island full of orphans who are all living together in this home who are taken care of by a very lovely mother. Um, and they just go about their lives every day until eventually they get adopted. Um, however... By the end of the first episode, um, one girl who goes to get adopted on her adoption day ends up leaving her stuffed animal rabbit behind. And so the oldest kids, who are the most responsible, decide, oh, we should go try and get this to her before she leaves, um, you know, our home and our community, because otherwise she's going to be sad without it. So they pick up the stuffed animal rabbit, they go to the gate, which they're never allowed to pass through, um, and what they end up discovering there changes the course of events for the rest of the series. Um, Again, I can't say any more than that, but what what I can say um, is that when I watched, um, I I first watched the anime uh, sometime earlier this year in the summertime um, because it looked interesting and I was like, okay, it's like a dark anime and there's children. I'm like, all right, well, it's dark. That's all that matters for me. Um, And I, I wanted to sit and binge through the entire thing in one sitting and Almost everybody who I have recommended it to is like, this is the best anime I've watched all year. Um, it's probably my second favorite anime, no, third favorite anime of all time. Uh, <laughs> like, everybody else who watches it has to binge through it all because it is such a suspenseful ride. Um, these characters, I mean, they're children. They're like 12 years old um, or going to be 12 years old soon. And it's remarkable the amount of like, strategy and game theory um, and processing that takes place amongst all these characters within the show um, and how they're thinking ahead. Um, again, I'm I, okay, I need to stop, otherwise I will get too much in depth and make some spoilers happen. Um, however, because, you know, the season one after 12 episodes uh, ends kind of a little bit on a cliffhanger, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go and start reading the manga because I want to know what happens. Spoiler alert, Ah, I I don't know what happens next because I stopped reading the manga when I found out that season two of the anime is coming out in January, um, which Ah, is like two years in the making and I'm beyond belief excited. Uh, But uh, as I was reading through uh, the manga, what I can appreciate about it is that, you know, the anime and the manga are very, very similar. You know, I think they handle how they present suspense a little bit differently. Um, You know, when you're working in a television series, you have the power of, uh, like, camera angles and the pacing of things. Whereas, like, sure, you can still get that from, like, looking at, like, a comic panel um, of, like, what you see and such. But I don't think the effect is as strong um, as when it's presented in full color in an animated way. Um, yeah. In fact, I think for me, reading the manga, the the biggest disadvantage that it has is that the it, everything is very small and detailed in it. Um, you know, when I was reading in the book, I was like, oh my gosh, this font is like size eight. Like, I feel like I have to like hold it right up in front of my face um, in order to wow. like, read things. Or like, again, there's there's so many little attention 
to detail, which ends up becoming a huge important thing in the story. Um, there's so many clues that are left for you along the way, but because you're so enthralled with the plot that is unfolding before you, you don't even think to pick up the clues until it's done. You go back and you're rewatching it and you're just like, oh my gosh, it's all right there. Like you see all these yeah. little things happening. And the same thing happens um, inside of the manga uh you just you start to notice little things in the background um or like certain like characters and how they react to other characters that are in the room and you're it's remarkable the again and this is a island full of children so there's at least like 15 plus characters i feel like that are cycling around in the story so it's a little bit to keep up with um but again you're just so enthralled with trying to uncover what's happening that like if if you are a detective at heart, like, yes, just go watch the show um, and or read the manga because you will have plenty to sift through. Uh, and like I said, it kind of ends you on a cliffhanger at the end of season one. Um, and the manga obviously has gone way past that and explored that. So there's plenty of material for you to consume. Uh, there's plenty of people on the internet, on YouTube, who have whole channels dedicated basically to like uncovering the pieces um like a crazy person on like one of those boards of the promised neverland and what occurs so yeah yeah Ugh. well it sounds very mysterious <laughs> i mean yes again i wish i could say more and for those who've already seen it you know exactly why i can't say more beyond what i have um but you will be enthralled with every single episode, you will not know what is going to happen next. Um, there's many episodes where you'll have three or four twists within one episode or within one scene. Like, th all these characters are always one-upping each other, um, which is, I don't know how they do that because they're children. Uh, but, he, oh my gosh, it's it's phenomenal. So phenomenal. And you will fall in love with all of our main protagonists and how cute they are. Um, and, again, how intelligent and how smart and how endearing. Uh, they are to one another as well so okay all right that's it i'll stop talking about it before i give more spoilers okay. away <laughs> yes you'll just keep going and then will. it will just yes just spill out. so okay all right so yes. yeah we have uh your horror thing to talk about next yes <laughs> all right so yes um on to something yeah, that would be, well, I mean, you know, it kind of takes place in wintertime, but that would be more appropriate for Halloween, I suppose. But yes, uh, so my next one is The Evolution, a first-hand account of the Rainier Sasquatch Massacre by Max <laughs> Brooks. And I decided to listen to the audiobook version because, well, like, I, I actually wasn't planning on reading this uh this book until i don't know where i saw it but i saw that it was a, a full cast mm. um version of uh this book and i saw the name nathan fillion and judy greer uh and i was like okay i'm sold i'm going to listen to it uh also it involves sasquatch which sounds very interesting um i i like cryptids and everything so i listened to the audiobook and it is very well done. Um, the fun thing about full cast audiobooks, I think, is it's like listening to an old timey radio show. Mm, yeah. Kind of. You know what I mean? So, um, because of the different voices, reading the different parts. And so that's always fun. And okay, so the plot of Devolution is there is this town called Green Loop that was founded in the Washington state in, in the mountains there, I believe it's called the Cascades. Uh, and they're kind of in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. And the whole thing is, is it's like high tech, but getting back to nature. And so the houses are smart houses that you can control from your iPhone or your iPad. Um, they use their own poop to make fuel. So like biofuel and to help heat uh, and, you know, operate things like that. I mean, it's, it was this guy's idea. Yeah, his name is Tony. And uh, his, like, vision of people, like, living apart from civilization, but still taking, you know, all the cool scientific and tech stuff of, sci of, of civilization. Like, they get their groceries delivered by a drone. Um, so, so the, but they're pretty isolated. They're, like, 90 minutes away from Tacoma, I believe. 
So anyway, there is a real mountain called Mount Rainier in Washington. Yes. And it really is a volcano. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't erupted uh, in real life. But in this story, what happens is it erupts. And uh, it basically out much of the land around it um, in Washington state. Like Tacoma is hit very hard. Uh, and the the uh, citizens of Green Loop are cut off from basically the world because of the volcano eruption. And they didn't think about emergency supplies, and so they don't have any. Um, and since there's no technology, there's nobody to talk to now. They're basically trapped until spring um, is what they think. And they're just like, uh, it's pretty stressful. And so what's interesting about the book is it's told through, so Max Brooks, the author, who is also a character, he is uh, an investigative journalist and he's narrating about how he, this, uh, this event in Green Loop was discovered through the journal of Kate Holland, uh, who, and that's who is telling most of the story. And that's the part Judy Greer plays. Um, and you listen to her journal of them arriving in Green Loop um, and then the events um, after that. And uh, he found out about it from her brother, who is still looking for her. Uh, and his name is Frank, and that's Nathan Fillion's part. And um, it's also, there's also interviews with uh, Head Ranger um, Shell. Uh, she was one of the first on the scene uh, of the Green Loop, you know, disaster uh, afterwards. And uh, so anyway, so they're isolated and they think they're going to have to like, you know, learn how to butcher food and raise food because they don't have enough food. And then the Sasquatches arrive <laughs> um, and they're also looking for food and it's just everything kind of goes downhill from there so i don't want to give too, i don't want to say too much but i mean like in the title it does say sasquatch massacre um so it is bloody gory uh i would say that um i the book is definitely an adult book i wouldn't recommend it for anybody 16 or younger um and uh, it the t- the tension from listening to it was also, uh, I think, really really added to the reading um, experience. Um, and you know, if I must say, if Max Brooks wanted to make me never want to visit the forest in Washington State, uh, and uh, then he definitely succeeded. Uh, because, and if he wanted me to realize i need way more survival skills and probably a gun uh i he succeeded on that point too uh because you're like going through this and listening to their experience and it's like i i am wow we rely on technology way too much and when it goes down it goes down and we are just Mm -hmm. so grossly unprepared for survival and um I also liked, so he does intersperse quotes Mm -hmm. at the beginning of each chapter from um, primatologists and different scientists, because basically what they're saying is Sasquatch is just another primate, a leftover from, you know, um, the era, you know, of the saber cats and stuff. They, it's Gigantopithecus. If you've heard of that, they're saying that's Sasquatch is, you know, descended from that, Uh, which is a very interesting theory, by the way. Um, anyway, and throughout, you're just like listening to this and going, he is really just emphasizing how despite our science and our technology and our big brains, we're just another primate. We are just another primate. And then when we run into a primate that's bigger and stronger than us, Mm -hmm. but, and, and also almost as smart as us, there's problems. Uh, and, uh. That when we are pushed to the limit, you will realize that, you know, we are just another animal. And, and yeah. So, anyway, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I liked the book. 
and the story. In fact, I liked it so much, I kind of want to listen to World War Z now, mm. which was his novel he did a few years ago, because it also has a full cast audiobook. Uh, oh, and so. yeah, so it's, you know, like, yeah. So I would, I would definitely recommend this to uh, fans of Bigfoot, obviously. <laughs> If you are really interested in Bigfoot or Sasquatch, uh, and then horror fans for sure, um, they would enjoy it. And it's just the, yeah, it's it just made me realize how much like you know we really rely on technology and way too much, and we are one natural disaster you know away from just complete breakdown and. So and that's like what the scary part is, honestly. Like I thought that was scarier than Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, as you were talking, I found it so interesting. Um, you know, we're talking about a volcano in Washington State. Uh, because growing up, like I was very fascinated with volcanoes and especially like Mount St. Helens, also, I believe, in Washington State. Yep. Um, and just like yep. the concept of like a volcano in the United States, you know, I, I couldn't fathom like what that was like um and the impact that I would have you know my concept of volcanoes is like psh, like I don't know lava everywhere thinking of Pompeii yeah um like all these horror like I don't know these action movies that are from the 90s of like lava pouring through city streets um and with like Mount St. Helens it really wasn't that kind of eruption you know it was more of like a landslide it was an explosion um, yeah and it blew out the side of the mountain yes but yeah. and the thing is so Mount St. Helens is really in an isolated area yeah and that's why there weren't as many casualties yes. as like if mount rainier yes like actually erupted like tacoma is right there yeah. on its slopes and like you know so it was they were just basically like you know where tacoma used to be like that's what they were saying in the book because yeah it it wasn't there anymore and I mean, yeah, no, I know. I'm fascinated with volcanoes too. Well, like, like Pompeii I, I got and, to go and... to Mount St. Helens last year. Like I hiked around there. And what's actually even more interesting involved with this book is if you go in the gift shop, there's a huge section of Bigfoot stuff. Like they are obsessed with Sasquatch and Bigfoot. And like, yes. just, and I didn't expect that when I went, but it's everywhere. Like in all the national park things you go to, especially like I said, on this mountain because yeah if you go it's just like this this vast land and this forest that's so dense and it's just yeah i can picture everything yeah. that you're describing about this book oh um, yeah and now like, i'm like it, i need to I'm read like, this <laughs> i never oh you should i bet you would like it i would love it uh, but yeah it might make you never want to like i'm like i think i'm good i don't want to hike in that forest I'm I don't know. I loved yeah. hiking through it. It was so <laughs> wonderful. And I think I would just be like so ex I don't know. Maybe not. I'll have to read it. Yeah. Especially because full cast audiobooks are one of the best things ever created. Uh, especially for a reading. They are, experience. they're so fun. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. All re anybody who's watching, if you haven't listened to a full cast audiobook yet, please go and do so. Um I'm in the middle of yep. listening to the third His Dark Materials book. Um, and that, all that series is also a full cast audio. It's just, oh, it's great. It's wonderful. Um, but so, okay. Okay. We'll go ahead. Yes, we'll move into, go. um, the next thing for the evening, which is a TV series I just finished watching this past weekend called Why Which I am so Women interested to hear about. I know. When I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, this reminds me of so many people that I know, including you. I I know you like told me you're like I'm going to be talking about this and I was like this sounds like something I would watch not you yeah. <laughs> so the concept of the show is that it's it's a fictionalized series um talking about different reasons why women might kill um you know and it's really uh interesting because they try to set it up to be like true crime um you know the very first episode opens where it's like um, the husbands, and then you'll have, like, interviews with each of the husbands, and they'll talk about something, um, and then you'll have, like, the wives, and they will all talk about something, um, and obviously, you know, it's fictionalized, you go through it, but they keep trying to play up on the suspense of you don't know what's gonna happen, um, so yeah. it's, it's, there's three women who are the main characters, and it's, I mean, it's a fabulous cast, um, you have, uh, Jennifer Goodwin, who many know of as playing Snow White from Once Upon a Time, she plays a 1960s housewife. 
Um, and then you have Lucy Liu um, from Kill Bill, Charlie's Angels. Uh, she plays a 1980s um, rich, I'm not going to say housewife because she's kind of in control of the situation, um, but we're living this rich and fabulous lifestyle. Um, and then you have Kirby Hal Baptiste, um, who is in uh, Veronica Mars, Barry, The Good Place. Um, and she plays then a 2019 lawyer. Um, and all three of these women, despite being from different time periods, all live with in the same house in Pasadena, California. So it's really interesting because you get to see the same house throughout each of these stories and how it's changed over time. Um, and they all like have these interconnecting themes that all starts with some sort of infidelity um, within the marriage. However, infidelity is not the reason why any of these women kill uh, in the story. And so it's no. very intriguing um, to watch and see who do they actually kill and why do they kill them um okay. and uh again it, it's so interesting because each episode will interweave the three different time periods throughout it'll just switch from scene to scene um but oh my gosh this show is some of the best match on actions i feel like i've seen um in television like where they'll mention something and then in the next scene you see it but it's a different time period um, and they have these wonderful motifs in each episode that and themes that spread across each of the three stories. Um, you know, the first one that really stuck in my head, I think, is in the second episode um, where it's it's pecan pie. Um, and like in the, you know, in the first story, we have our 1960s housewife who decides to go and confront the woman uh, who is sleeping with her husband. And so at the diner, she has pecan pie. And then... In the 1980s one, um, the wife is visiting a hospital, um, and she's eating, like, a bag of pecans. And then you'll see, like, in the third story, in the present day, um, after an interesting um, open marriage situation with our main couple, uh, they the husband decides he's going to serve pecan pie to everybody. And I just remember being like, like, it's a subtle detail that doesn't actually have that much to do with the story, but the fact that somebody took the time to craft in this little thing within each of the storylines to connect it um, is such a beautiful detail touching. Yeah. Um, and it's like that. There's something like that for each episode. And like I said, there's obviously, um, you know, connecting themes throughout each episode. Um, and it's amazing to see just how their stories develop so differently from one another, even though they all start in the same way way um and like it's definitely a show where when it first came out it got really bad reviews for the first couple episodes because it's a slow and building show um you know you yeah. watch the first couple ones and you're just like these are outlandish women like they are not realistic they are saying dumb things um and like especially like, the 1950s like housewife scenario oh my gosh you have like the perfect housewife and she literally walks around everywhere and she's like as you think of a stereotypical wife um and then the husband who's mm -hmm. like well i'm gonna do this bad and i'm the perfect husband like it's just like oh my gosh this acting is so <laughs> over the top um but i think it's intentionally doing that to call out some very interesting stereotypes that we see um in these particular time periods or how we think of women in different time periods. And then as the story goes on, the, those acting, um, you know, style, like, it calms down. It tones down throughout. Um, uh -huh. To the point where you end with, I think, some very sincere and real characters who I literally was crying at the end of, like, the first season. I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I'm just so sad. Um, and I think this is going to be a show where, like, one season – it tells the story of these particular women, and if they do another season, yeah. it's going to be a completely different cast of characters and a storyline. Um, but definitely, if if you like um, cheesy or punny lines, uh, the show is amazing because every single title um, for the episode is some sort of like catchphrase from like American pop culture that's been changed into be like um, like a killing phrase. I'm trying to think. I think, like, instead of, like, there's no crying in baseball, like, this is a dumb one out of the list, but, like, there's no, like, killing in baseball or something, um, and, like, it's, <laughs> but there's, like, actually really clever ones, and they're very long titles, but I love it, uh, from start to finish, it's just, I was laughing out loud, and it's definitely dark humor, um, but, oh my gosh, it's so good, and, like, just the amount of times, like, that these women are just, like, 
yeah, being pushed to their boundaries. Um, the, the intricate plots that end up happening. So, oh, uh, yeah, you would love this, Shannon, and anybody else yeah, out there who, who likes sassy <laughs> women or true crime um, or just murder in general. If you like murder, go and <laughs> if you watch like the murder. show. <laughs> <laughs> if you like murder this is the show for you <laughs> that's right we have everybody yes. covered here at the library <laughs> yes. oh my gosh but hey mystery books are popular for a reason same with true crime so, so true that's something this, we're fascinated by and i mean the show is also nice because it's only 10 episodes long so like you mm-hmm. could easily just get it through binge it and like i said it's like not gonna have a continuation after this season of these characters so you don't have to worry about like a sh- the show being canceled like it's a complete storyline yeah nice yeah well that d- that sounds yeah definitely like something i would watch <laughs> It's worth it, 100%. And yes. if anybody does watch it, please let me know um, which is your favorite housewife. Um, and mine, by the way, is the 1980s one. So, now everyone... Ah, uh, Lucy Liu. Yes. I love Lucy Liu. She's phenomenal in this show. Absolutely phenomenal. Okay, but yes, so, let's go okay. ahead. Let's transition to something that's not okay. so murdery, I presume. Yes. Finally, after our lovely, dark episode of Things... I am going to talk about uh, my another cheesy holiday movie because I love them so much. This is my time of the year. Um, and Hoopla had decided to put like all the Lifetime Christmas movies from 2019 on, which was like I was so excited about and I don't have enough borrows to watch them all. So if anybody wants to give me their hoopla borrows, let oh, me man. know. Oh man, this would have been a perfect time to add a little like thing like down below in the Twitch stream to be like, <laughs> please donate down here if you have extra yeah, hoopla borrows. Yeah, please donate your hoopla borrows to me so I can watch them all. Yeah, so what I did was I, I was like, well, I can't watch all of these Lifetime movies on here. Cause, and it's not just the Lifetime ones. They have a bunch of holiday movies on there. Um, about half of them I've already seen. Um, because they're either on Netflix or Hulu, mm-hmm. but, uh, the Lifetime ones aren't on Netflix or Hulu. So that's why I was excited that I got to see them. And, uh, but since I can't see them all, I narrowed it down to watching the ones that had a lead that at least one of the leads was a person of color because, nice. you know, it's not just white people who fall in love. And <laughs> I was. You know what I mean? Yes. And and the holiday movies up until, you know, recently have been overwhelmingly white. Mm-hmm. So I was like, hey, I'm going to watch the ones that have two people of color as the leads or at least one. And so those are the ones I watched. And uh, and then I decided to talk about the one I enjoyed the most. And so this one is called Christmas 9 to 5. Yes, it's a stupid title, but most of them are. Um... And what it's about is uh, Jennifer, the lead there. She is a newspaper reporter. And she gets the assignment to go undercover working retail at um, this department store to find out the true meaning of Christmas. And uh, the department store is uh, this, like, the last family-owned department store in Chicago uh, called Desmond's. And she just loves this store, and that's why she wants to, you know, go there. Um, And then the other other half of the romantic lead, uh, his name is Jack Desmond, and he is the store manager as well as the heir to the fortune. It's called Desmond's. His last name is Desmond. Um, His great-grandfather founded it. And so she goes undercover. Um, They don't know she's a reporter. And she's going to, like, you know, embed herself as a floating holiday, like a seasonal worker. Um, to And while she is doing that, she finds out that the store is in financial trouble and might close. And so there's that. And she, you know, she doesn't want that to happen. And um, I liked this one um, because... One, like, they, the two of them liked each other from the beginning. Like, mm. you can, they were attracted, liked each other from the beginning. Because a lot of the holiday movies are, like, hate to love, mm-hmm. you know, or yeah. rival. That's, like, the theme for a lot of the, the holiday movies. 
Um, and so this one was different in that, like, you know, they liked each other immediately. And they even, like, admitted it to each other. Uh, there was just, like, other things getting in the way, you know. And I was like, well, that's different. Um, which, And I'm like, it's kind of nice to have some them not, like, automatically not like each other mm-hmm. and then switch. Not that I have a problem with that trope. Obviously, I love these cheesy movies. But um, And then they were very charming, um, the leads. Um, I forgot to write down her name. But um, the lead actress, she's in The Good Place. Um, oh, and yeah, uh, she... I totally know who that is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Nice. Yeah. And, um, she's just really charming and, um, you know, and then even the, the lead, he was very nerdy, but I liked that about him. Um, and the plot actually did surprise me a couple of times, which is really unusual in a, in a holiday romance. Um, I won't tell you why it did because i don't want to like ruin the surprise but uh you know so that was something that i enjoyed and then i don't know if you know who george went is the actor no i do not um he was in cheers the the tv show cheers Mm -hmm. way back in the 80s um he's also a voice in toy story um i'm trying to remember which one he was oh gosh why can't i remember i think he's the pig um, but anyway, mm-hmm. he plays Manny, the elevator operator, mm-hmm. and I just love him. I loved him from Cheers, uh, and he it just is just, I just loved him. I just love him as an actor, and so having him be the, the old-fashioned elevator operator who's still there after mm-hmm. being there since he was 16, uh, was just a really good addition. I mean, there was, uh... A few unrealistic things in the movie like there is. I mean, for one, I've worked retail during Christmas and she's wearing high heels all day. That No. And then she doesn't even act like her feet are tired. They would be killing you. So <laughs> that was one thing I'm just watching going, you don't wear heels. No. Um, and then, you know, like the employee dating the big boss that has a few issues uh, in real life. But, you know, I I also liked the movie because it's like, it's a love letter to department stores and newspapers and things that some people consider old fashioned now. Like, and they mentioned that a few times, you know, like newspapers, they're obsolete. Why do you even need them anymore? Same with department stores. Everybody shops online. And I just really loved that it was like the movie was a love letter to, you know, yeah, these things may be old-fashioned, but that doesn't mean that they're not important or that they're obsolete, and some people mm. still really love them. Um, like, I th- I think I mentioned the other day how much I really want to go to a mall. Yes, like, you did. I just, you know, because that's what I used to do all the time as a kid, and I, I can't now because you can't go anywhere. But... You know, and so I was watching this going, yeah, you know, I remember being a kid and going to the department stores with my mom and my grandma. And, you know, it was so I, I really liked that. Um, and then I, I did also find out after watching this mini Lifetime Christmas movies, um, because I watched how many hoopla bar- bars do you get? Eight? Maybe. I think I so. Yeah. So I think I've watched eight of them now. Um I, I have their formula down now. I could write one myself. Um, I would like to say that so the formula for the Lifetime Christmas movies is one or both of the romantic leads will have lost one or both parents, either through divorce or death. Usually death because divorce is kind of depressing. Um, and so, like, seriously, it's always that. And then... There's always an older couple that gets together also at the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, George Wentz Nanny uh, gets together with his old flame. But, like, seriously, in every single one, there's, an, like, an old people couple that gets together at the end. And sometimes they're cuter than the, the younger couple. Um, and then it's almost always the uh, uh, woman is... a. Uh, Oh, you know, a working woman, and she hasn't found time or wanted a uh, romance in her life, and then she finds the romance. Um, and then I also noticed they somebody always has a daughter or a niece, 
nobody ever has boy children in these movies. I don't know why. <laughs> like, there's no boy children. Like, they always have a niece or hmm. somebody's got a daughter or something, you know. But, like, yeah, there's no boy children. It's very strange. There's got to be some deeper meaning to that. Viewers, please go and take that idea and, like, write a thesis on why are there only uh, women, like, why is there only nieces in these shows and no nephews? Yeah. What is going on? What is the hidden meaning behind that? Yeah, or it's, you know, mm. he's a single dad and he has a daughter. And it's like, okay, so nobody ever has boy kids anymore? Like, it's just... I just, after watching so many of them back to back, I was just noticing all these patterns. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just, I was like, wow, this is interesting. I could write an entire, like, paper, like, analyzing all the patterns they have in these movies. But, you know, I know some people, including my husband, make fun of me for just loving these movies because they have those. It's like a pattern, a formula, and, you know, but... That's actually probably the reason why I like them because they're comforting. Yes. They always end with me smiling because, you know, like love, love wins in the end and it's holiday and there's snow and lights and music. And yeah, so I, I would recommend if you like, like Christmas, you know, or holiday romances, get on Hoopla and um, check out some of these Lifetime movies or any of the other ones, too. So, because they'll they'll make you smile. So, <laughs> but yeah, Christmas 9 to 5, I liked that one. I can also recommend, let's see, the other Lifetime movies that I liked a lot was um, Rediscovering Christmas was the other one. And then Radio Christmas. Okay. So those were my top three. Yes, it's like they have to have Christmas in the title. Oh, that's part of the formula. Yes, it is. It is part of the formula. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't wait to see all of the scripts that are going to be written now after this show. Because we've now yes. we've released the secret revealed... formula, the secret recipe. Which is actually really funny because I did just watch the KFC Lifetime movie last night yes um which also i need to do that still it's 16 minutes it's free online if you want to see this formula like condensed in a very like 16 minute time period um i think it almost matches it yeah except for it's not about well actually no it is kind of christmasy yeah so it's 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 wild oh lifetime thanks for bringing us so much joy this holiday season is there a, is there an old couple that gets together at the end i'm trying to um like, kind of... I'm not perfectly I mean, there's not a lot of time. There's 16 minutes, and there's mm -hmm. really, like, how many... One, two, three, four, five... There's, like, five characters, really, in it. Um, yeah. So, it's it's a little hard to get the formula perfectly, but it is a very true-to-form true to uh, life, lifetime movie. Uh, just hits all the points. Yeah. And you get some great catchphrases in with, there. Yeah. But with... Sanders. Uh, and played by Mario Lopez. That's right. Oh, <laughs> uh, 2020 has been such a weird year. It has. So, and on that note. Yeah, so here we go. Let's, uh, we can wrap up, uh, wrap the, up. the content that we went over this evening. Um, so, you yep. know, if, if Mario Lopez as the Colonel is not your thing, uh, don't worry. <laughs> Go ahead and check out uh, one of these other great titles that we talked to you uh, about this evening. Or if none of these titles caught your eye, uh, remember, we do have seven other episodes that are all on YouTube, and you can go watch those and find some other great recommendations. Um, and if none of these meet your fancy, you can always uh, submit a Books on the Go request for you teens out there who are listening. Or we do have now surprise bags uh, for our adults out there who are like, yeah, I want to get some surprise books or items. Uh, yeah, please just go ahead and fill out one of those forms for us uh, and we're going to be happy to get that to you this holiday season free of charge because we are the library yes and i and i love picking out books so definitely fill one of those out because you know i i haven't gotten to do one yet so it's it um i don't so know if please do it for shannon yeah. 
please, please do it for me. Um, fill out because fill out a uh, books on the yeah. go form, which actually you can down below. There is a link to that. If you click on the graphic, you can go to our website, fill it out, write a request. You can even ask for Shannon personally when you're filling it out, and we'll make sure that Shannon fills it out for you when she's working this. I'll week. be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, All okay. right. Well, yeah. that's it for us for 2020. So uh, we hope you have a wonderful holiday and rest of the year. And, you know, we'll uh, maybe we'll see you in January. Yeah. Be safe out there, folks. <laughs> yep. Have a wonderful holiday, everyone. Stay warm. <laughs>